Following the end of the siege of Toulon in December 1793, Napoleon had been dispatched into the Piedmont region, which straddles the border between France and Italy today. He spent much of 1794 here, involved in military operations against Austria and its allies in regions such as the Kingdom of Savoy and the various Italian republics and small states which made up the region north of the Papal State. His growing political position was emphasized in his close ties to Augustin Robespierre, the government attaché to the Army of Italy and brother of the leader of France in all but name, Maximilien Robespierre. On Augustin's command, Napoleon was involved in a diplomatic mission to the city of Genoa in the summer of 1794, the purpose of which was to try to draw Genoa, one of the few states in Western and Central Europe which had managed to remain largely unaligned in the war of the First Coalition, closer to France. While Bonaparte was in Italy in 1794, the reign of terror led by the Committee of Public Safety, of which the Jacobin Maximilien Robespierre was the most prominent figure, continued apace in Paris and across France. But by mid-1794, France had become tired of the excessive bloodshed and the monopolization of power by figures like Robespierre. A violent backlash ensued on the 27th of July, 1794, just days after Napoleon's journey to Genoa, when Robespierre was ousted from power and executed the following day in an event known as the Thermidorian Reaction. The Thermidorian Reaction could have proved fatal for Bonaparte. He had been a Jacobin for several years by that time. This in itself was hardly an overly nefarious crime, but during the reign of terror, Napoleon had become associated with the Robespierres and others tied to the government led by the Committee for Public Safety. Owing to this, he came under suspicion during the Thermidorian reaction, and on the 9th of August, 1794, Napoleon was arrested at his house in the city of Nice in southern France. He was then taken to the nearby town of Antibes and detained in a military fort. Over the next 10 days, he waited anxiously as the investigations were carried out into his actions over the preceding year. This was a tense time for Bonaparte. The guillotine had been resorted to for all manner of trivialities in France of late, and there was no guarantee that the young Corsican general even needed to be guilty of anything to lose his head. But fortunately, he kept it. On the 20th of August, his jailers gave him the news. He was free to go. Despite its growing number of victories on the battlefield in the Low Countries and elsewhere, the revolutionary government in Paris and France still continued to experience periods of pronounced chaos and unrest in the capital. A clash between the royalist faction in Paris and the Convention and those who wished to preserve the gains made since 1789 was now brewing and it began to come to a head early in the month known as Vendémiaire. Shortly after midnight on 13 Vendémiaire, or the 5th of October 1795, Napoleon arrived at the Tuileries Palace, where Barras asked him to take charge of the revolutionary forces. By that stage, as many as 25,000 royalists had amassed in Paris and the surrounding area, and were moving to surround the old royal palace. Against these, Napoleon was able to pull together about 5,000 troops who were faithful to the revolution within the city. He then told Barras that he intended to deal with the insurrection in his own manner, something which Barras consented to. His plan involved having dozens of cannon brought from Neuilly to the Tuileries and set up around the perimeter along with his Republican infantry. Then, at dawn, when the Royalists began to move forward to seize the Tuileries and power in Paris, Napoleon ordered his soldiers to open fire. But by early morning, hundreds of Royalists were dead around the Tuileries Palace. Napoleon was a hero, and his time in the political wilderness following the Thermidorian reaction was at an end. The weeks after 13 Vendémiaire saw Napoleon's love life shifting rapidly. In the spring of 1794, he had begun a relationship with Eugénie Clary, a sister of Julie Clary, who his brother had married late that summer. Napoleon's courtship of Eugénie had continued into 1795, but she had largely remained in the south of France where she hailed from, and the long-distance nature of the relationship had led Napoleon to compose 
Clisson et Eugénie, a romantic novella, while they were apart. The subject of it was the doomed nature of a relationship between the main character, a French soldier, and his lover. Life imitated art, and Napoleon's relationship with Eugénie collapsed during the course of 1795. Instead, he began seeing Josephine Beauharnais, the daughter of a wealthy French sugarcane farmer who had owned a plantation on the island of Martinique in the Caribbean. The surviving letters between them in these early months point to Napoleon being completely besotted with his fiancée in the first months of knowing her. They were married on the 9th of March, much to the consternation of Napoleon's family, who were appalled that he had chosen to marry a woman six years his senior and who had two children from her first marriage. While his whirlwind courting of Josephine was occurring, Napoleon was also laying the seeds of his next ascent within both the military and French politics. Prior to the Thermidorian reaction, Napoleon had developed ideas for how the military campaign in northern Italy should be carried out. These were ignored in the months that followed as he found himself cast adrift politically from mid-1794 onwards. But his role in foiling the attempted royalist coup d'etat on 13 Vendémiaire had seen Bonaparte's star rise again. In this situation, he was able to successfully petition to be given command of the Army of Italy, which was floundering at the time, as French resources were primarily being directed towards the conflict in the Rhineland region of Germany. Thus, on the 11th of March, 1796, two days after his marriage to Josephine, Napoleon left Paris to take up command of the Army of Italy. Within days of his arrival on the front, he solicited a loan of three million francs from some Jewish financiers in the city of Genoa, and then used this money to invest in the supplies and equipment of the Army of Italy. Much of this focused on the minutiae of army command, such as having thousands of new pairs of shoes delivered to the front for his soldiers, and plentiful supplies of bread. Armies march on their feet and their stomachs, and men whose feet aren't sore and whose stomachs aren't rumbling fight better when they need to do so. Napoleon's micromanaging of such issues at a time when the concept of army logistics was still thoroughly underdeveloped in Europe was part of his genius. With victory in northern Italy and the incursion into Austrian territory in the spring of 1797, the government of Emperor Francis II in Vienna realized that they had more to lose than gain by continuing the war against France. Peace negotiations were initiated as this reality dawned on the Austrians. These eventually concluded in the Treaty of Campo Formio, which was signed between the French and the Austrian governments on the 17th of October, 1797. The treaty was a resounding victory for France against its most bitter enemy in the War of the First Coalition, which had been raging since 1792. After the Treaty of Campo Formio had been finalized, Napoleon determined to head back to Paris. He had become an increasingly politicized figure while in charge of the Army of Italy, founding two newspapers while on campaign to manipulate public opinion surrounding his actions while he had also sent aid to Barras, Charles Talleyrand, and other members of the Directory government in the autumn who had secured additional control over the government through the coup of 18 Fructidor. He left for Paris himself in early December and arrived in the capital on the 5th of December. In late 1797, and even into 1798, there were still plans being considered to launch a major amphibious invasion of Britain with Napoleon considered the best candidate to lead the expedition. Shortly after he returned to Paris from Italy, he met with an Irish rebel leader, Wolf Tone, to consult about a possible invasion using Ireland as a base of operations. But this all changed in the early spring of 1798, as Bonaparte convinced the Directory of a new, enormously ambitious military endeavor. The plan was to lead a major naval expedition to Egypt, occupying the region and then using this as a springboard to a subsequent military campaign into Asia, with the ultimate goal of wresting control of India from Britain. The expedition landed near Alexandria at the Nile Delta on the 1st of July, capturing the city the following day. In the days that followed, Napoleon and his sub-commanders began fanning out across the north of Egypt, 
and preparing to make their descent southwards towards Cairo. All the while, proclamations were issued alerting the population that the French were there to liberate the country from Ottoman oppression and the rule of the Mamelukes. On the 12th of July, Napoleon began his move towards Cairo. On the 21st of July, they met the Mamluk army led by the two co-rulers of Egypt, Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey, on the Giza Plateau outside Cairo. The exact location of the battle was a site called Embabe, but with the fighting taking place adjacent to the only surviving wonder of the ancient world, it is more typically referred to as the Battle of the Pyramids. Within a few hours, the Mamluk army had been decimated, with thousands killed or wounded next to a few hundred casualties on the French side. With victory in the Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon victoriously entered Cairo and assumed control over Egypt. While the Battle of the Pyramids seemed to indicate swift success for the Egyptian expedition, it was followed soon after by disastrous news from the north. As Napoleon and his officers and technicians were settling into ruling the country from Cairo, Nelson had finally struck with his Mediterranean fleet against the French Armada in the Nile Delta. The Battle of the Nile, or Battle of Abukir Bay, took place over three days, from the 1st to the 3rd of August, 1798. On the 1st of August, Nelson's fleet arrived. His 14 ships of the line did not outnumber the French, but the Royal Navy was the greatest naval force on earth at the time, and the French were caught off guard. Consequently, within a few hours, several of the French ships were sunk, including the French flagship, the Orient, and nine were captured. Napoleon and the Army of the Orient were now trapped in Egypt, with their supply lines and lines of communication back to France cut off. He determined to return to France. While Napoleon was in Egypt and the Levant, a new pan-European war had erupted. The War of the Second Coalition, as it is known, had commenced in the final weeks of 1798. Napoleon arrived back in Paris on the 16th of October 1799. He found the political situation much changed from what it had been when he left to take over command of the Army of the Orient in southern France a year and a half earlier. The Republican government was teetering on the brink of financial ruin, as the cost of renewed warfare mounted from late 1798. Heavy taxation and the resumption of the levy en masse conscription made the Directory government extremely unpopular and there were fears of a new invasion of France itself by the various powers allied against the country. Into this environment, Napoleon returned to a hero's welcome. His absence in Egypt and the Levant had benefited him greatly, allowing Bonaparte to disassociate himself from the unpopular directory. Napoleon began plotting to seize absolute power in France as soon as he reached Paris in mid-October. Napoleon moved on the morning of 18 Brumaire in the revolutionary calendar, what we would know as the 9th of November 1799. That morning, Lucien Bonaparte brought claims to the Council of 500 that a new Jacobin coup was imminent. This invented insurrectionary threat was then used as the pretext for placing Napoleon in charge of the city's military forces. With these forces, Napoleon began securing government buildings across central Paris. With this, the Parliament was effectively disbanded, and with the collapse of the Directory the previous day, the government was no more. Napoleon had seized control of France in a bloodless coup. While the coup of 18 Brumaire and the rubber stamping of the new consulate government through the creation of the new constitution had seemingly brought Napoleon to power in France, his position was still tenuous, at best, as 1800 began. Napoleon was more than aware of this and knew that he could only cement his grip on the nation if he speedily brought the war of the Second Coalition to a successful conclusion. With that in mind, in the spring of 1800, having assembled a significant force, he headed southeast towards Italy. Napoleon's Italian campaign of 1800 has become synonymous with one particular engagement which occurred not long after he descended into northern Italy in the early summer. The Battle of Marengo took place on the 14th of June 1800 in the Piedmont, approximately 70 kilometers to the north of Genoa. 
Napoleon's forces of nearly 28,000 men were only marginally outnumbered by the 30,000 soldiers led by the Austrian commander Michael von Mellers. But the Austrians did have a major advantage in terms of the size of their artillery train, with Napoleon only having 15 large cannon at his disposal, while von Mellers had upwards of 100. To add to his woes, Napoleon was caught off guard when von Mellers engaged in a surprise attack on the French forces spread out in the region at 9 a.m. on the morning of the 14th. Owing to this, the Austrians were in a very advantageous position by the early afternoon, and General Claude Victor Perrin, who was in charge of the French divisions on the left flanks, had to fall back in the face of Austrian gunfire. At this juncture, the result of the battle seemed so clear that General von Mellers left Marengo to inform Emperor Francis II of Austria, who was at the nearby city of Alessandria, that he had defeated the French. Von Mellers' overconfidence was a factor in his defeat. The other factor was Napoleon's bold intervention in the battle. Seeing Victor's men retreating, he and General Louis de Say gathered the remaining cannon together and galvanized their forces for a counterattack. Charging directly against the Austrian center lines, they unleashed significant damage on the enemy, though not without great danger. De Say himself was shot through the heart and killed, but the charge which he had led turned the tide at Marengo. In the hour that followed, the Austrian lines broke under the French assault and began to flee, many being killed as they slowly gathered around the Bormida Bridge, the only crossing point to their rear. By the evening, Napoleon was in charge of the field of Marengo. Marengo was Napoleon's greatest victory to date, though one which owed a huge amount to Desay's brave counterattack in the early afternoon. With his latest victory over, and the Austrians assured by the Battle of Marengo, peace negotiations between France and Austria commenced in the final days of 1800, as Emperor Francis II informed King George III of Britain that he was no longer able to keep his country at war with the French. Several weeks of talks culminated in the signing of the Treaty of Luneville on the 9th of February, 1801. With the end of the War of the Second Coalition, and the peace terms he had secured with Austria and Britain, Napoleon's ascent to power in France was confirmed. It was around this time that Napoleon is believed to have said to one acquaintance that a throne is only a bench covered with velvet. But in the months that followed the end of the War of the Second Coalition, Napoleon would be tempted into crowning himself as master of France and then of Europe.